Hear the Pentecost story from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11 and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. The author Annie Dillard tells this story in only a way that she can of a time when she was camping in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. She hauled all her things with her up a mountain. She went to get away to read. And so by day, under a tree and by her tent, she read, and at night, she read by candlelight in her makeshift kitchen. At night, flies and moths and bugs, attracted to the flame of the candlelight, would swoop in a bit too close and get singed by the fire. But then came this one moth and this one night. Dillard writes, one night, a moth flew into the candle, was caught, burned dry, and held. This golden female moth, a biggish one with a two-inch wingspan, flapped into the fire, dropped her abdomen into the wet wax, stuck, flamed, frazzled, and fried in a second. Her moving wings ignited like tissue paper, enlarging the circle of light in the clearing and creating out of the darkness the sudden blue sleeves of my sweater, the green leaves of the jewel weed by my side, the ragged red trunk of a pine. And then this moth's essence, this spectacular skeleton, began to act as a wick. She kept burning. She burned for two hours without changing, without bending or leaning, only glowing within like a building fire glimpsed through silhouetted walls like a hollow saint, like a flame-faced virgin gone to God. It's kind of a morbid story, but it stuck with me and it always comes to mind when I read the Pentecost story. The day when the church was born in the midst of a terrible fire, says Beekner. The story begins with the disciples huddled together in an upstairs room they were terrified for many reasons, but the most pressing being that something like a cyclone had touched down. 
Out of a clear blue sky, a torrent of raw power and wind hurtled its way through the atmosphere, and as it drew near, it sucked the shingles off the roof. And then out went the insulation and the drywall, and the walls shook, and the floor beneath them rocked. And through the now silhouetted walls, they could see the whole darkened sky above. And then came the eye of that storm, and from it, fire from heaven rained down on their heads. But they didn't burn up or out. Instead, they lit up. Pentecost is the day those disciples became brave, because they had to. In each and every one of those tender human hearts huddled together in that upper room, a light switch flipped on. Fire all around them, they realized they weren't waiting in the dark. They were walking in the light, and they always had been. They weren't children who followed a teacher. They were men who labored in the vineyard Jesus talked about, and the harvest would be mighty. On Pentecost, the disciples became emboldened because they weren't mere moths drawn to the flame of Jesus' light, but instead they themselves were light in a dark world, pointing to the light of it all. Here's the unsavory truth. Pentecost is actually quite violent and scary. Just like the story of Easter is violent and unpredictable and life-changing, this story, too, is that. It's a radical climax in the gospel story. Strangely and sadly, we rarely give it its rightful weight or celebration. We celebrate Easter for 50 days, and then we get to Pentecost, and we give it one day and one sermon, if you're lucky, if you're lucky enough to be in a church that actually celebrates Pentecost. And I can make some sense of that. The Pentecost story in our English translations reads a little bit like a recipe card. First there's a shake of wind and then a pinch of fire, and then the disciples speak some different languages and voila, church on a platter. But this is not a boring story, not at all. In reality, it's sci-fi thriller meets heroic fantasy, and I'd argue that it's one of the most significant stories in all of scripture. Without it, we certainly wouldn't be here today. A quick look through the varied English translations of this passage gives us a significant clue that there is something potent and complex here, so much so that the translators wrestle with how to describe in words what's actually going on. We know that, the, that on Pentecost, the Spirit of God comes on the scene in power. Acts 2.2 describes this entrance. But here how the different translations try to describe it. In the NIV and the NASB, we get the word violent. The NLT uses the word roaring. Another translation says impetuous. The ESV says a mighty rushing wind. The NLT, a mighty windstorm. Whatever actually happened, it's wild and it's urgent. A torrent of God's power comes on the disciples. This isn't Dorothy being swept away from home sweet home and touching down safely in Oz. It's more like run for the tornado shelter and batten down the hatches because a storm is coming and the landscape will never be the same. But that's not often what we think of when we think of Pentecost. Right? Always we are trying to pare the claws of the lion, which is what Dorothy Sayers wrote in her book, Letters to a Diminished Church. She cites C.S. Lewis. It's this idea that we take the mighty and majestic Lion of Judah and make him quite a bit less mighty and majestic and much more manageable and modest. It happens all the time. It happens with this story. Often we give the Pentecost story a Groupon priced pedicure treatment. We focus on the spirit coming down in power, yes, yes, 
but then we twist this power so that it isn't frightening or overwhelming. Instead, the spirit with us becomes an entirely comforting presence, a near to us spirit power that envelops us with love and assuages our ills and griefs. God's spirit is, after all, and according to Jesus back in the Gospel of John, our great comforter. We get the word comforter from the Greek word parakletos, Anglicanized, it's paraclete. And this word is variously translated as helper, comforter, or counselor. And all of those words depict a very cozy and comforting spirit god. Mind warpy is the fact that parakletos is actually a justice-related term. Our English word advocate begins to touch on its meaning, but only slightly. So an image for God's spirit better than a bed, bath, and beyond fuzzy blanket is actually a cutthroat defense attorney in a power suit who screams at the judge when he busts out the gavel. That's the spirit. Most unfortunate is the fact that I've never seen the spirit depicted in an, as an intimidating lawyer in a well-tailored blazer. I haven't ever seen that on a church bulletin or a banner. What I have seen on church bulletins and banners is the Pentecost story depicted with an image of a dove, along with beautiful, delicate, and dancing flames. And that's because elsewhere in scripture, God's spirit is likened to a dove. In Jesus' baptism, the spirit of God comes down as a dove. This pure, graceful animal ultimately represents peace. And so the spirit comes down in power, but is in essence, peace. And this is all true and theologically sound. God's spirit does comfort. God's spirit does bring peace. There is dove imagery found throughout scripture. Obviously, God's spirit can be depicted as more than one thing at the same time. The thing is, in the same way that Groupon deals are misleading, so are our feeble English translations of epic Bible stories. In the Pentecost story, there is no word of comfort, and there is no dove pictured. Rather, God's spirit is presented as a presence more wild and violent than we'd probably like to admit. The real Pentecost story says something like, once upon a time, a hurricane straight from heaven dropped a furnace onto the disciples' heads and they all went mad. There's a terrible fire, and from it, the church is born in power and with urgency. I often wonder, and because I am personally tempted to do this, what happens to this story and our faith when we don't pair the claws of the lion? What happens when God is just wild and the story is just unsettling? C.S. Lewis wasn't the first to use the lion imagery to describe God. That too is an image that depicts God in scripture. The prophet Amos writes, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can help but prophesy? It's a word that points to Pentecost. That roar was violent, impetuous. It sounded like a mighty rushing wind. It was a roar so terrible that it tore apart the sky and everyone who heard was smarted, seized by the truth that God's powerful spirit had come. And all who heard began to prophesy Every one of those disciples spoke the truth, even if it meant they would face danger, and even when it made them seem absolutely drunk off their behinds crazy. And they did seem crazy. But their message spread like wildfire. That's Pentecost. And I want us to see this story for how wild it is. This massive, hard to describe, destructive event changed the disciples' hearts forever. Maybe because their very lives flashed before their eyes, or maybe because 
they finally realized God's not messing around. They're emboldened. They immediately begin to try new things. They take risks. They speak in languages that aren't their own to neighbors they wouldn't normally interact with. And more. Read the rest of the book of Acts, and those changed disciples go to uncharted territory to the ends of the earth with a message. That roar you heard? It was the king speaking. Bow down. I think previously, before Pentecost, the disciples were like moths drawn to a flame. Their little wings got singed while spectating the flame. But after Pentecost, the disciples themselves became a wick, a light, a flame setting the world around them on fire. From this chapter on throughout the book of Acts, the story really does get insane. The disciples are on fire. They heal people. They raise people from the dead. They filibuster the Sanhedrin to the point that they convert. They share everything they have. They show radical hospitality. They dream dreams and have visions, and the visions become reality. They become the church, and their numbers grow daily. It's a weird sight to think about a moth stuck in wax becoming a wick and burning and burning. But that is about as good an image as we have for the disciples after Pentecost. And the truth, of course, is that that should be an image of us on fire for Christ, dead to ourselves and our own lives and always burning for Christ. That should be an image of us. I don't think it is. The truth is some of us burned out a long time ago. We got disenchanted with the whole story. We'd rather be comfy and cozy, snuggled up to our clawless spirit God, rather than have our hair set on fire by the real God. And I get it. Also, this is a problem. A big problem, actually. I don't have all the answers. But I do believe that we would be drastically helped if we all stopped making God out to be like an electric blanket, a source of on-demand comfort. What if we understood God's spirit at work in the world to be what it actually is? Dynamic, powerful, violent, unpredictable, wild. In the last book of C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, the children are reminded that their whole life is lived between the paws of the lion, who is not safe or tame. And I think it's a really good image. Our whole lives are lived between the paws of the lion, powerful, mighty, he just might get you, wild. So where am I going with this? My main point is that Pentecost should unsettle us. There's a yikes factor here that should inspire us, wake us up out of our monotonous, doldrummy days that are so relentlessly pockmarked with uninspired time wasting. Pentecost should unsettle us, inspire us, it should remind us of God's unpredictable and matchless power. And we should want to be out in the world like the disciples, just lighting it all up. And we can start today. Like the disciples, we are in an upper room. According to scripture, in this famed upper room, the disciples ate with Jesus. He taught them. He breathed on them. 
And it's there, most scholars believe, in that same upper room, God's spirit swept in like a typhoon. Fun fact, this chapel sanctuary space is literally and formally called Chapel of the Upper Room. As you leave today, you can look at the more than 50-year-old sign that is just above those doors. Chapel of the Upper Room. It's even called that on the building's blueprints. And if you don't think that that was intentional, then you don't know church architecture. Could God's power come down on us right here and now and tear the roof off this place and light us on fire? Oh, yes. Absolutely. And maybe that's what the architect wanted us to think. There are no windows here. You can't see what's coming for you. Or vastly more practical and probably, there are no windows here. So we shouldn't be all that inclined to spend much time here because it's a little too safe here, a little too walled in here. Here we huddle with other disciples to worship, to have our faith rekindled, to ultimately go out there into the world to light it all up to point to the light of the world who on Pentecost came down in power and remains with us still. Let's pray. Lord God, we do ask that you would fill this place with your spirit, fill our hearts with the spirit. Lord, forgive us for trying to tame you. Help us to see you at work in the world in the wild and unpredictable ways that you are and help us to just get involved. Rekindle our hearts, light us on fire again for you. In Jesus' name we pray.